Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much, Arlindo, for the kind invitation to be here, and thank you all for being here. Uh, well, I'm with the collections company, Flying Sharks. We work mostly with public aquaria. I know that's a delicate issue, and I will try to address that issue and also explain some of the technicalities of our work and what it is exactly that we do and how we do it. So, uh, keeping animals in captivity has been an ugly business for many, many years. I mean, it was very ugly for many years. Animals were basically kept solely for entertainment, for novelty, you know, to show people uh, the animals that they were unable to see on TV or, or anything before those things happened. So this, this was actually a very ugly situation for, for decades until more recent times. So why exactly do we, do we uh, keep these animals in captivity? Is it just for fun? Is it just to sell tickets? Do we want people to come in through the admission gates, you know, to make some money? Or is it because we want to do something else? And I'll never uh, forget an episode uh, where I used to go to dinner parties and, you know, it, you people introduce each other and I would tell them I've been working with sharks for 30 years and I worked at the Oceanario de Lisboa, the big aquarium here in Lisbon. And I used to be the cool kid, you know. Oh, this guy works in sharks, you know, he's at the Oceanario, blah, blah, blah. And then a few years ago, I had a holiday in Vietnam, and we went diving. And you know how people introduced to each other on the boat, and we were all just, you know, getting to know each other. And it was mostly young kids, you know, teenagers, you know, backpackers, and they were doing all sorts of things. And then it got to me, and I explained I worked in the aquarium industry as a supplier. And there was this dead silence, just silence. And suddenly, I was the asshole on the boat. I was the guy who put fish in boxes. And that, to me, was such an eye-opener, you know, because I wasn't used to that. I used to be the cool guy that works with sharks. Suddenly, I'm the piece of, eh, you know what, that's putting these fish in jails. And that made me think, is that what I am? I, am I a piece of, you know, uh, that, um, that are putting fish in boxes? So let's see. So the public these days demands change. And, uh, and it's a good thing. And it's a good thing. And I'll just, a little disclaimer, personally... I don't particularly like to see marine mammals in captivity, so we mostly work with fish and invertebrates, but that's a whole new other story that I'm happy to go into at the coffee break, maybe with a glass of wine or something a little stronger. Uh, but, you know, these things have, uh, have become very, very delicate over the years. We've heard the horror stories of, you know, how uh, mammals are put in captivity. You've all probably seen this, uh, this movie. And uh, again, more horror stories. So all of this basically came to the point where, you know, are we the dark side? Are we evil people out there collecting poor defenseless uh, sharks raised in fish and octopus and, and invertebrates solely to make money? Well, I like to think that that's not who we are. And this is uh, what I wanted to share with you today, especially the technicalities. Don't worry about the detail there. This is just a summary of a talk that I gave nine years ago at a conference in Genoa. At that conference, nine years ago, I tried to make this point. Now, it was easy that day because I was talking to aquarium people, and I made a huge summary. It actually took me a lot of time to make a summary of conservation projects that are funded by, uh, by public aquaria, very much like our friend from Patty just did. We, even at my company, Flying Sharks, we donate these small grants. We've just crossed the 100,000 euro line, which of course is, you know, small, but, you know, to our size. So we've, we've, uh, we're working with these aquariums that basically display these animals, but shower people with a huge message of conservation and climate change and education. And, and that's why we do it. But again, the purpose of my talk today is to share with you some technical aspects of our work. This is just to frame where that work fits in. And uh, I was very pleased to, to hear uh, talk about uh, sharks just before. I've been personally uh, doing research on sharks, especially shark fisheries, for nearly 30 years now. And I like to take partial credit, uh, uh, as in us aquariums, for changing the image of sharks. It's no secret that sharks, you know, a few decades ago, you thought of a shark and everybody would think, well, it's a horrible creature that's going to eat my children. Uh, not anymore. Sharks have become cuddly creatures like panda bears, um, almost like panda bears. And then public aquaria have done a lot to, to change that image. So, are we the dark side or are we up to the challenge? So, I, 
would like now to share with you one of the technicalities and one of the ways that we do our work. So before I click play, this video is about 30 seconds long. This happened at the Oceanario, where I worked for 12 years. I was in charge of the open ocean tank, the big exhibit right in the middle. And there was a TV crew from RTP, you know, the Portuguese channel, that was there to shoot a special, an episode on, uh, on the Oceanario. And they were there and they wanted, of course, to get underwater footage of sharks. They wanted to get like the exciting images, but there's a very, very rigid rule at the Oceanario that's still in place today. No one but the staff dives in the Oceanario tanks. So RTP wanted to dive and we told them, no, you cannot dive. Our head diver, you know, João, can they take the footage uh, for you. So they explained how the camera works and they said, listen, João, we really want to have like really close pictures of sharks. And I'm like, well, okay, I'm a bit of a movie buff. So I remembered Star Wars, episode four, you know, the first one, where it starts with this Star Destroyer just going on the screen and it just goes on forever, forever. So I wanted to do that. But the thing that most people don't realize, but of course you guys, you're divers, you know this, sharks are actually very nervous. It's not easy to get close to a shark with a camera, it'll just swim away. So I thought, how the hell am I gonna get some close footage of a shark? So I went down to the kitchen where my friends were preparing the food for the sea otters and the birds and the other fish and everything. And I rinsed myself in crushed sardines. I had my little sardine deodorant. And I put some octopus in my BCD. And I basically grabbed a bunch of different things. And I had this octopus, dead octopus, on a piece of PVC. Octopus are great because they've got all those eight feet, you know, so they kind of dangles in the water. And I had this thing off the camera. And I basically laid on the, on the bottom and just kind of kept an eye on the sand tiger shark as it kept swimming away. So this is just, uh, the, this is the beginning of that documentary and the image that I want to show you will come up in just a second. So these are the penguins. So I was laying on the bottom and here we go. There we go. So that's how you get really close footage of a shark. You rinse yourself in crushed sardines and very oily stuff and it works pretty good. If you ever need to do this, uh, feel free to then give me credit when you get your National Geographic Award. Anyway, so then I left the Oceanario and I started my own company, Flying Sharks, which should come up any second now. Okay, there we go. Give me just a second. Can I get some help? Ah, there we go. Okay, so very formal company, as you can see. You know, we, we, we're all in suits and ties. And uh, yeah, um, I'm just gonna talk over this. Uh, these are my, my friends. Most of them are my students from Paniche. I teach at um, school over there, marine biology. And we basically collect animals, but we do it in the most absolutely responsible way that we can. We do it one by one, as you will see in some videos next. This is us in Olhão, working with some tuna fishermen, catching some live animals. This is a sunfish. We've shipped these all over the world. Everything is done absolutely by hand. Uh, you've probably heard some horror stories of cyanide and trawling and all sorts of horrible things. That is absolutely not how we do. We move these animals inside these big tanks, mostly in cargo flights. We usually ride on the cockpit. This is um, myself and a friend delivering some rays to the uh, Oceanium in Stralsund in uh, northern Germany. And as we finish now this short video, pay attention to the coolest t-shirt you've ever seen that I'm wearing. And it is um, a bit politically incorrect these days, but it's still the coolest t-shirt that you've ever seen. So it's gonna come up now. This is a big party. We work hard, but we play hard. And heh, coolest t-shirt ever seen. Okay, sorry about that for the dolphin lovers. <laughs> Here we go. So that's us in uh, Orta, in the Azores. Uh, collecting um, animals. Basically, when I say we collect them by hand, I mean we collect them by hand. This is one by one. Our clients always complain, ah, you guys are too expensive. To which I politely reply, well, why don't you come over and do it yourself? Because, you know, it takes a lot of work, a lot of time, a lot of money to do it this way. We collect our animals absolutely one by one, which is the, the, the safest way to do it. I'm just gonna jump to the next video, which is basically the same, but in Peniche, which is an hour north of Lisbon. I recommend if you, you know, if you like, if you have some time, you wanna go do some cool diving, we, we can set you up with a couple of uh, outfits there. 
This is a, well, it's not a deep dive, it's about 15 meters, but you know, you have maybe 30, 35 minutes of bottom time and you have to plan. You have to plan really, really carefully what you're gonna do, how you're gonna do, where you're gonna go. And here we are again, myself with Nuno Rodrigues. He was the speaker at the Diving Talks last year. And um, there we are collecting tiny little gobies. And uh, again, a lot of work for just one little goby. And we basically chase them, sometimes they swim away, and it's, it can be a little frustrating. And a whole dive, we can come up to the surface with maybe three, four, five fish. And, and that's how we do it, to make absolutely sure that it's done in the most um, ethical and, and correct way. I'm just going to jump forward here and show you some pictures. So, and I think Nunu eventually is going to get a little tiny little fish. And I'm just going to jump real quick so we don't run out of time. Uh, he's going to catch one right now, and I'll just jump in. Nah, 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 nah. Yeah. See, it's, it's, sometimes they run the last minute. That, there we go. Trapped it between the nets. There's a nice picture of us in Panish that day, and a close-up of tiny little goby inside. So our facility in Panish is not very sophisticated, uh, I'm afraid, but it gets the job done. We've, it's actually, this slide is a little old. It's a little better now. Uh, our, our facility in Orta, if you get a chance to travel to the Azores, by all means, come by, visit us. We're at the Aquario de Porto Pi. Nice relationship with the local government, so it's Flying Sharks facility, but the door is always open to the public and to schools, mostly to schools, which is one of the reasons why the windows are so low. We want little kids to be able to look inside, so that's why every adult has to go like this, but it's really good for kids. So that's us packing some fish in Paniche. Notice how the guys are wearing pajamas. We usually pack around 1, 2 a.m. We want the fish to have the shortest transit time possible. So we pack at midnight, 1, 2, and then we go to Lisbon, drop them off at the airport or UPS, where they travel for 24 hours. So that's at the airport. And here's where I really wanted to get at. So we work in cooperation with a lot of companies from all over the world, like Dynasty Marine. People a lot of times think that we're competitors. Well, not so much because we do the same thing, but they do it out of Marathon Key in Florida, also out of New York. We do Portuguese animals. And we have some friends in Australia as well, Cairns Marine. So we, we mostly uh, work together as in, if someone needs fish from our neck of the woods, they're gonna uh, you know, point people in our direction and, uh, and the same uh, the, way, the other way. So our friends from Balneário Camboriú, in the south of Brazil, very close to Florianopolis. They wanted a couple of sand tiger sharks. Uh, big sharks, expensive, you know, uh, expensive transport. So we bought the sharks from Dynasty, who flew them to Sao Paulo. And then we basically did the road transport from Sao Paulo down to Balneário. 650 kilometers, doesn't sound like much, but the roads aren't perfect. It took us about 20 hours. But the main point here is preparation. So my friend Rui Guedes right there actually flew one week in advance and he was training the staff how to handle the stretcher, how to do everything. We, we don't want to have inexperienced staff handling live sharks for the very first time. So we train and train and train. That young lady was our, uh, our shark and we were handling the stretcher going up the stairs with her and we asked her to wiggle inside the stretcher just like a shark does. So everybody was used to that process. This is the checklist of equipment for that road trip, the 650 kilometer road trip, and this thing went on forever and forever and forever and forever and forever and forever. I'm going to be here until 6.30. And forever and forever. So 228 items on the checklist of equipment to move two sharks from Sao Paulo to Balneário Camboriú, 650 kilometers away. This is the, uh, the small van, generator, pharmaceuticals, drugs, anesthetics, all sorts of things, spare water. And that's me and Rui. This is uh, in the middle of the pandemic, opening the, the box, the tank where these sharks flew in. And there they are, two perfectly healthy uh, sand tiger sharks. And that's us driving to Balneário Camboriú. The sharks are inside that big truck. We stopped every now and then. The tank was a little heavy, as you will see. We had to get the sort of heavier aquarists to jump on the back of the forklift so we could even out the weight so everybody was holding on to their breath as we were moving this big, very, very heavy tank. We had to drain some water to make sure it wasn't too heavy. And there's the, the tank coming in. I'm just gonna jump to the fun part. That's me inside the tank. Have to re re remove the lid. 
gently placing these sharks in a stretcher. We do it one by one. We never use anesthetics. We always have them on our, our checklist and we have them on our kit. But to be honest, I never really found the need to use anesthetic except for one situation that I'll show you in a couple of slides. So basically, the key is you move very slow. And we train that. We train everybody just keep quiet, you know, and let's have just one guy giving the orders and everybody just keep be as chilled as possible because the last thing we want is to make that shark even more nervous than it is. We don't want everybody being crazy. And then, you know, gently tie the ropes around the stretcher and we went up some stairs. Once we get inside the tank, I gave the sharks one shot of antibiotic, merely as prophylactic. I know veterinarians don't really like when you do antibiotics as a prophylactic, but trust me, in these cases, we had veterinarian support, of course, and it's actually a good idea, just to prevent some bacteria or something to develop, you know, uh, because of the stress of all the trip. So, the way you do a shot in a shark, if you ever need to do that in your diving career, is if you just puncture the skin with a needle, that shark's just going to swim away. So the trick is you hold to the fin, the dorsal fin with one hand, and then you do your shot with the other hand. That way, if the shark swim away, you'll go and swim away with it. So that's, that's basically how, how you do it. So there, I did a couple of shots. We did one uh, on each side of each shark, so a total of four. And I was also training the local staff to do it. So that's uh, me doing one and then doing the other on the other shark. And now I'll show you some video of this young man, Romulo, an aquarist from the Brazilian Aquarium, doing his very first shot on a shark ever. And he did an absolutely amazing job. I couldn't be prouder. So he saw me do a couple of shots, then he's gonna go for this one, and notice how he's just gonna nail it absolutely perfectly. Holds the dorsal with one hand, and gives the shark the antibiotic with the other hand. Beautiful job. So, big celebration, and I'm nearly finished. I see my time is up, but I'm going to be done in about 30 seconds. Big celebration. But next um, summer, there was an issue. Well, one of the sharks was developing this weird abrasion on the skin, so we had to go back to Brazil this time to restrain the sharks so that the vets could look at them and see exactly what was going on. So this is when we did a lot more training again, and this time we did use anesthetics. The problem is when you puncture the skin of a shark, which is very, very tough, and you shoot the anesthetic, a lot of times the sharks jerk, and you can actually see the anesthetic going out of the needle, not into the muscle. So they don't get the full dose, as you will see in this very short video. This is a, the female shark, and uh, I've been in the water for about an hour at this point, because the anesthetic really didn't work as much as we would like to. I have got a bunch of Brazilian friends, they're kind of sort of over here, you will see it just as soon as I go around the corner. There they are inside this vinyl box that we put together, huge box out of uh, transparent vinyl. And as I steer the shark into the box, I see that the box is too high. So you're going to see me go like this, kind of desperate. Come on, come on, we got to get this thing. We can't let it get away again because we've all exhausted. And finally, the shark swims inside the box. And then, of course, we close the lid and we gently bring it up to the surface so we can do all the veterinarian work. I was actually wearing uh, venom um, snake gloves that day. You know, they're very thick and they're not very, they're easy to work. But um, we, they're actually very good. Uh, if you get a big shark bite, obviously it's not going to save you from getting your bones crushed, but it will save you from getting your skin teared. So ven uh, snake venom gloves are actually a very good thing to work. So, I will finish off with, uh, I invite you to come to the Flying Sharks uh, website. Go to the literature section where you will see a lot of stuff, like a lot of stuff. So we like to think that the, the way we're doing things is not that bad. Um, there's a paper of some uh, conservation projects that um, uh, OIAC, the European Union of Aquarium Curators, has funded over the years. Another paper I did for the UN Encyclopedia on the Sustainable Development of the Oceans, again showing um, all the wonderful things that have been done by Public Aquarium over the years. And I will go back to my original question, you know, can we raise to the challenge? Can we actually do things in a way that by keeping this very, very, very small amount of animals in captivity, but with absolute pristine conditions that actually allow them to surpass their life cycle in, this, in these conditions, in these huge tanks, 
longer than in the ocean. And we like to think that, yes, yes, you know, uh, we are passing on a conservation and educational message. And with that, I will finish. And thank you again for the, your kind invitation 